would like to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Um, this is a very special event. It's more than likely the first one of its kind in California at a minimum. Uh, obviously, we're here to attend a smart meter town hall forum. Um, I grew up here on the Central Coast. I, my day job is working for the Coalition of Labor, Agriculture, and Business of Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. And um, on the side, I do a radio show that's on AM 1290 and AM 1440 up north. I lived in Santa Barbara County for most of my life, but I now live in Napomo. And for those of you that don't know what Napomo is, the best way to describe it is the Montecito of Guadalupe. <laughs> now, I got permission to bar borrow this iPad for a demonstration. Um, I've got one on order. Uh, there, it's five weeks away. And it was, when I was in the store looking at this, I looked at some of the different things you can purchase to go with your iPad. And I asked this guy what this one particular item was, and he said, that is a remote, basically kind of a remote thermometer, where you plug this little device into the meat, you go back in and watch TV or play with your iPad and it tells you when the meat hits the temperature you preset. This is the society we're living in. Electric blankets, cell phones, Bluetooth. You see the advertisements for smart appliances where you can turn on the appliance with your cell phone, your smartphone, or your iPad. And we, of course, we still have cell um, towers. We still have high voltage lines. And the question is, is the flip side of the convenience a health threat? That's one issue. Another issue is, well, if people can con control our use of electricity, can they control our lives? Is, is Big Brother around, lurking around the corner and is going to tell you when and when you cannot do your dishes, your laundry, or run your dish, you know, toaster or what have you? That's one of the issues. Then there's another issue of California mandating energy savings and energy uh, uh, conservation. What happens when you won't give up your plastic bags at the grocery store? Will they come and take them in the name of saving the planet? So we have Big Brother, but we also have what might be the green movement telling us you must, you have to conserve energy because of the needs of our society and, and saving the planet from the emissions and even from the generation. This is a complex issue. There's a lot of different things to think about. I, I am... Uh, chagrined that we have an empty seat here. Uh, Southern California Edison had been invited. We thought they were coming, but they are not here. And I wish they were because, you know, I don't know personally, I don't know uh, that much about science in terms of what am I getting from my cell phone, my Bluetooth, or the power lines in our area, my wireless computer connections. I don't know. And I'm hoping that the panelists are going to give us some science, some health science, some physical science, and the other things to help us make an informed opinion about what's going on in our society. And I'd like to welcome a couple of VIPs, um, Michael Self, Councilwoman. Uh, from Santa Barbara and Frank Kotchkiss on the council as well. Uh, one of the donors is John Woodward and um, we also uh, need some housekeeping here. There, we're going to ask you to uh, turn off your cell phones and um, I also need to give a disclaimer. I used to do commentaries on KCOY's morning news and the joke was their disclaimer was longer than my commentary. And uh, so anyway, the views of the panelists, the moderators, and the MC 
are not necessarily the views of the Santa Barbara Tea Party and vice versa. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, David Spady. He is the California State Director for Amer of, of Americans for Prosperity, which has 1.6 million members. He heads things up here in California from his office in Camarillo. He's going to take it from here. And I'd like to give, hope you will give him a big, warm Santa Barbara welcome. Well, I'm glad to uh, be with you here this evening. And uh, it's 1.6 million nationwide, not here in California. We have about 103,000 members here in California. Uh, the issue of smart meters involves a lot of things uh, that, that we're going to talk about tonight, from the privacy issues to government intrusion to efficiency for the energy companies to the health issues that are involved in this. And we have a, a great panel tonight, a very well-rounded panel to address these issues. And uh, I'm going to begin by introducing our panelists from your right to left. And um, then we'll begin with opening comments from each of them that will last about five minutes. And after that, we're going to go into a question and answer portion. That's your opportunity to engage in this debate. And there will be uh, two opportunities. One is by filling out one of those cards at that little table back there that I think you can still fill out and hand to one of the uh, folks in the back of the room that we'll then um, choose questions from. And the other will be an open mic that we'll take around uh, for the second portion of the questions uh, where you can actually ask questions at that time. And each of those will be around uh, two minutes responding uh, from our panelists. So on my uh, left, your right, uh, I want to introduce Joshua. Uh, Joshua Hart is uh, the founder of StopSmartMeters.org. Uh, he's worked in the uh, energy industry as a transportation planner, environmental advocate, and a freelance journalist. He obtained his MS in transport planning in the UK at UWE Bristol in 2008 and completed research entitled Driven to Excess, Presenting the Social and Quality of Life Impacts of the Car Traffic on Local Residents. Uh, the research was covered in over 100 international media outlets, including the BBC, The Guardian, Tehran Times, and The Daily Mail. His writing has appeared in Surveyor Magazine, Walk Magazine, Make Magazine, Car Busters, The Lonely Planet's recent anthology, Flightless, Incredible Journeys Without Leaving the Ground. Uh, to his right is um, uh, Cindy. Cindy Sage is owner of Sage Associates. She's local here in Montecito, California. Sage is a nationally known environmental land use consulting firm specializing in the assessment of factors that affect the stability of land for conservation and for development. Her specialty area of practice is in the effect of electromagnetic fields. She provides environmental monitoring, EMF site assessment, and EMF policy evaluations for electric transmission line and wireless antenna cell tower projects. She's a research fellow at Orobor, Orbero, Arebro, Arebro. Uh, University Hospital, School of Health and Medical Sciences, Department of Oncology, Arebro, Sweden, uh, where she's uh, also a guest lecturer. Uh, she's a founding member 40 years ago of the Environmental Defense Center in Santa Barbara. She was one of the first lecturers in the Environmental Studies program at UC Santa Barbara and developed and taught classes there from 1972 to 1981. She was appointed by the Governor of California to the Board of Registration for Professional Engineers. She's the co-editor of the Bio Initiative Report and founder of the Bio Initiative Working Group. She's published many scientific studies on electromagnetic issues, including the science public policy, legal, and environmental consequences of exposure to EMF. Currently, she is the co-facilitator of the Collaborative for Health and Environmental EMF group and full member of the, in, the Bioelectromagnetic Society. She was invited to provide expert testimony to the California Council on Science and Technology on smart meters. Anthony Farrington uh, is a Lake County supervisor. Uh, he graduated from UC Davis with a degree in government relations and received his Juris Doctorate from Concord Law School. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Regional Council of Rural Counties and an association, which is an association of 30 rural California counties and the board of directors for the California State Association of Counties. 
Um, on his county's behalf, he received the California's Green Leadership Award for using solar energy to power facilities that treat, transport, and recycle wastewater. He's been a staunch advocate for the protection of local water resources and had a, a large fight with uh, Nestle that uh, they ultimately prevailed in. And today he finds himself in a similar battle taking on PG&E and their deployment of smart meters. He shouted out loud and clear that smart meters <laughs> offer nothing to the consumer. He's put pressure on the CPUC to implement an opt-out proposal and has received support from his colleagues to seek a court injunction to halt the installation of small, smart meters on the legal grounds that the installation of smart meters should be subject to the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. On my right is Tony, uh, is Mark Tony. He's an executive director of TURN. Uh, Mr. Tony sets the organization's strategic course and directs TURN's legal and political advocacy on behalf of over 37 million Californians. Uh, before coming to TURN in January of 2008, he successfully ran a nonprofit consulting business focused on coaching executives, executive directors for effective strategic planning. He's uh, received his BA from Brown University and holds a doctorate in communication resources. He's also Kellogg National Leadership Fellow, and his leadership accomplishments have been featured in Mother Jones Magazine and Brown Alumni Monthly. Turn is the leader on California utility issues, advocating on behalf of rate payers and making sure that utilities stay on track to meet renewable energy goals without overburdening poor elderly uh, Californians. Next we have Tyson Slocum. Tyson is uh, the director of Public Citizens Energy Program in Washington, D.C. He joined uh, this program in 2000 as director, and they promote decentralizing, uh, decentralized sustainable energy and providing affordable clean energy solutions for working families. He covers the regulation of electricity, natural gas, and petroleum markets, including commodity futures and FERC jurisdictional, jur jurisdictional matters to promote stronger transparency measures. He's the author of numerous reports on these subjects, presenting his findings and testimony before the U.S. Congress. He appears regularly on radio, print, and television, including guest appearances on the Colbert Report. Prior to Public Citizen, he was a public policy analyst at the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. He received his B.A. from the University of Texas in Austin and grew up in Newport, Rhode Island. Thank you. And finally, <laughs> we have Orlean Curla from Santa Rosa, California, and she has uh, a number of titles. She's served as president of Concerned Citizens of Sonoma County, Parents Involved in Education, vice president of Santa Rosa Republican Women Federated, and editor of their newsletter, and is president of uh, Sonoma County Eagle Forum. She's been involved in this issue uh, and has, has written uh, uh, a, a published booklet on this called Smart Growth, Smart Grid, and Smart Meters. Um, and just say no to Big Brothers, Smart Meter. Just say no to Big Brothers. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Orlean. So we'll begin tonight um, with Cindy, and uh, she's going to give an overview of this issue, and uh, and then we'll we'll go across the panel from uh, right to left. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I want to um, I want to go over tonight um, as an introduction. Twelve reasons. Um, I call them fatal flaws, why smart meters as a program really ought to be retired. And I, I think that what brought you here tonight might be one of those 12 things. Not all of us are here for the same reason, but by the time you look over those things which are really objectionable about smart meters, um, we're going to have a lot more in common. And it's vital that you're here tonight because Southern California Edison will start rolling out smart meters in the, in the area closest to us tonight in May and June and throughout the rest of the year. With no warning to you, they'll simply send a company one day to take your old meter and put on the new wireless meter. So the timing is good. So what are these fatal flaws? Well, first of all, this is billed as a green energy solution, and yet it's people that save energy, it's not smart meters. And if consumers reject these meters for any one of the reasons we're going to talk about, then this program fails. It simply fails without consumer support and your willingness to bring even more radiation into your homes on every appliance. That's the fatal flaw. 
really there are no energy savings that we can see with smart meters. Even with a bigger buy-in from people, the cost to produce the meters, to install the meters, to operate the meters, and then to store all of that data, that wireless data somewhere, takes lots of energy, and no one has ever done that energy economic balance. There is no balance sheet for this. Third, there really isn't any demonstration of FCC compliance with the existing public safety limits. And those limits, if you've read our bioinitiative report, you will, you will know, are way too high. But these smart meters and the way they're being installed and operated will violate even the FCC's public safety limits for some area of your property. And if your meter is located very close to living space, this is not a good thing for you. And then beyond that, the levels of radio frequency radiation will be excessively high. We wrote a report on this, which we can talk about later if you want. It's sort of heavy science and heavy technical stuff. But we have the facts. And when we challenge the utilities to either show that we were wrong in our calculations or do their own, they've been silent. Fourth, the health effects. Health effects are going to come in, in various ways. There are two radio frequency antennas in every smart meter, both of them producing radio frequency wireless microwave energy. There is also the problem that they create something called um, dirty electricity. And this may be new to some of you, but it's a part of the battery switching. And it's a second level of carcinogen and neurotoxin, at least we believe it to be. Fifth, we know from many, many studies done in, in good scientific journals, published peer-reviewed science, that radio frequency microwave radiation makes worse chemical carcinogens. The damage done to cells within the body is greater if you have both the chemical carcinogen and radio frequency. So this, this is a concern for everyone, but certainly people who are perhaps um, in delicate health or recovering from cancer already, uh, or who have other unavoidable chemical exposures need to know this. Sixth, obviously, the privacy and the hacking issue is paramount. These meters and the information stored in them is your personal information, and it is not safe. In fact, San Diego Gas and Electric decided they didn't want to have any responsibility for, for once, once they collected, they went to the PUC and said, well, don't hold us accountable because nobody can protect the, the privacy of information. They wanted a pass to blame someone else. Um, security and safety. We have seen fires. We have seen explosions. We have seen issues that relate to placing a wireless meter on a particular building where there may be faulty or inadequate electrical wiring or grounding. This will trip ground fault interrupters. It will it will trip things that matter to the integrity of your and safety of your home. It's a national cybersecurity issue. We need to come back to that later, and I think someone here may cover that in more detail. This is a problem for people with medical implants, deep brain stimulators, wireless insulin pumps, and so on. It frustrates solar. And you know, we've got a great solar fellow and expert here tonight who maybe will chime in with either expertise or questions, but you know. Solar energy is a great way to save energy, right? Well, they're incompatible with these wireless meters. Think about that. And finally, this does impede the undergrounding of utilities. And this is a, a visual impact kind of an issue. But you know, in communities like the one I live in, we want to underground our overhead utilities. They're so ugly. Property values rise. People like the area better, it's safer. And if you have all of the antennas around town collecting the smart meter emissions, do you think we'll be able to underground? Probably not. So those are my 12 fatal flaws, any one of which really ought to retire the program. Thank you. Joshua Hart. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It's great to see the, this room packed. And thank you to the Santa Barbara Tea Party uh, and others who organized this event for having the foresight to recognize a threat when it's upon us and doing something about it. It's unfortunate that Southern California Edison could not join us this evening. 
Uh, apparently they feel that their evidence of safety will not stand up to public scrutiny, and I think that's, uh, it would have been good to have a dialogue with them. Um, I'm here to report the experience from Northern California. I live in Santa Cruz County and got involved in this campaign when PG&E sent us a letter saying they were going to install a smart meter on our property. Since that time, uh, the installation of wireless smart meters has been an ugly chapter in our history. All the problems that Cindy mentioned, uh, the root problem is that there was never a public consultation on this. We are being uh, charged through our increased rates uh, several billion dollars. This is our money that's going toward this program, and yet we were never consulted on it. Uh, that's at the root of all this. And, and uh, it's been ugly. You know, we've had uh, PG&E uh, uh, and, their, their, uh, and Wellington Energy, who work, is working for them, their agents, intimidating uh, elderly people, threatening them with turning off their electricity in the middle of winter if they do not accept a smart meter, when they were never asked or informed beforehand. Uh, at Stop Smart Meters, we've been inundated with calls and emails from people throughout PG&E service territory who are suffering from health impacts related to the smart meters. And I want to share a couple of stories with you. Uh, a woman who used to live in San Francisco bought a house in Half Moon Bay on the coast uh, to get away from the wireless uh, in the city because she was becoming increasingly sensitive. Uh, with no warning, PG&E installed a smart meter on her, on her house. And from that point forward, she couldn't sleep in her, in her home. She just could not get to sleep. She had hot flashes, uh, ringing in the ears. And she called me the other day. She said uh, she's been sleeping in her car in a church parking lot because she's got nowhere else to go. And her appeal to the Public Utilities Commission, to, to every uh, state agency she could find, to PG&E has gone unheard. Another woman, Rebecca from San Diego, a successful uh, uh, therapist, psychotherapist, they installed the smart meter on her home, uh, a bank of them, and she lived in a, a condo. Uh, she started getting heart arrhythmias, uh, ringing in the ears. Uh, she thought she was having a heart attack. She went to the hospital. Her cardiologist was very alarmed, uh, and she became electrosensitive from the installation of the smart meters. And this is, this is echoing hundreds of times over. We are inundated with these, these calls from people, uh, and we can't get back to all of them. We just don't have the resources. But it is, it is heartbreaking to see uh, previously healthy people become sensitive. And they can't even be around cell towers or cell phones anymore. Um, you hear these stories, and it breaks your heart. You know, what do you do? We've gone to the Federal Communications Commission, the Public Utilities Commission, the governor, the Department of Public Health. Uh, any agency that has responsibility for this, no one does anything. Uh, the inaction on the, on the state and federal level is in stark contrast to the growing revolution amongst local governments. We now have 40 local governments, cities and counties throughout the state of California, who have formally opposed this program and, uh, and declared their desire for a moratorium. Yes, they deserve a round of applause, including Lake County. But, but the installation continues, and people are not protected in their own homes. So what do you do? You know, do you just say, oh, well, uh, they're going to install, they're going uh, to hurt our health, they're going to violate our privacy and, and endanger our safety? Well, Stop Smart Meters has been at the forefront of a direct action campaign. Uh, you may have seen some of our videos on our website. We've, uh, we've been standing in front of trucks. We've been preventing these installations. Uh, mothers and grandmothers have mobilized and have uh, been arrested in the North Bay. Um, there's growing concern over the safety and health uh, impacts of wireless technology. But what's particularly uh, what en enrages us is that this is a frivolous use of wireless technology. It's not necessary. Th those meters aren't mobile. They're on your house. They could use wired technology. They could have done this so much better, but they didn't do consultation. The current opt-out plan that's been proposed by PG&E um, is not a solution. Uh, charging people to maintain their health can only be called one thing, and that is extortion. So it's so uh, uh, hopeful that everyone is here today, uh, here in Santa Barbara. Um, I think you know this represents uh, a coming together of different parts of the political spectrum to say, you know, we demand the right to be informed about major investments that affect us. We uh, put our right to health and our right to privacy and our right to safety above the other issues that divide us. And we come together and we say, no, we want a moratorium on this issue. We want no further smart meters installed. And we want hearings to find out why people are being made sick uh, from these meters. Thank you.
Anthony. I've elected to uh, take the podium. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to see everyone in the audience, which is probably pretty important when you're a Democrat in Northern California. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for being here this evening, uh, for taking the time to become informed. Uh, I know these are trying times, and uh, we have a lot of issues to be uh, confronted with and con to uh, contend with, in, in particular with uh, the, the economy and the fiscal crisis we find ourselves in at all levels of government. I'd like to express my appreciation to Heather Bryden uh, for reaching out to me and uh, asking me to come down here and uh, share some of my visions and experience uh, as we battle with PG&E uh, in Northern California. I, I told Heather when I was asked to, to come down here when she indicated that there was a Santa Barbara Tea Party that was helping organize and facilitate this, I had two requests. And the first request was that uh, she would not force me to wear a tinfoil hat. Uh, which uh, she has honored uh, thus far, and uh, maybe to construct a bulletproof podium. But I, I see that uh, uh, she got my height uh, logistics a little bit uh, off, so to speak. But, you know, the smart meter issue is uh, an issue that crosses all party lines. It doesn't matter if you're members of the Tea Party, Coffee Party, uh, if you're Republicans, uh, Democrats, Libertarians, or Vegetarians. It is, uh, it is an issue that we can all unite behind. Uh, I'll tell you just briefly a little bit about Lake County. I'm, I'm proud to say that we are an energy exporter. Uh, not only do we lead uh, California in geothermal resources and taking treated effluent and pumping it up to the geysers into that geothermal layer and, and where it creates steam and turbines for energy. Uh, in my district, uh, I was a leader and advocate for bringing on uh, the largest municipal solar arrays in the state of California in the western United States. We produce uh, 3.4 megawatts of energy uh, for those solar arrays in my district and throughout the county of Lake. In addition, in addition, we are now uh, negotiating uh, with Alta Gas out of uh, Canada to develop a wind farm. And uh, uh, we are looking at uh, generating uh, uh, approximately uh, 55 megawatts. Um, why this is important, it shows that uh, our county and our board of supervisors had a history of working with utility companies. Uh, but right now we find ourselves in, uh, at odds and in adversarial positions. Uh, I had no idea that smart meters was such a big issue until some residents uh, in my community had approached me. Uh, they came before our board and they expressed concerns about health and privacy and security concerns uh, and cost and increasing utility uh, prices. The thing that one item that really caught my attention was the uh, the implementation by our illustrious members of the PUC to uh, switch over uh, starting in 2006, where they approved uh, the deployment of smart meters. Uh, they had implemented rate structure changes uh, with the motive, and, and it's always sold uh, uh, by that, that those of us that are considered green that this is to help uh, curtail. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, though we see science and studies that show that the actual installation, Connecticut in particular, uh, does no such thing. It does not detour the usage. Uh, time of use and peak day use charges uh, is going to go into the wallets of my constituents, our ratepayers. The health concerns has been addressed, uh, whether those parameters are safe, especially for those uh, that fall under the American Disabilities Act uh, that are most vulnerable, our seniors, those that are ill. Uh, security and the integrity of our system uh, is very important and you know, find it uh, find a somewhat humorous that uh, the show you wear the PUC uh, as leadership is lacking is that uh, once we wanted to preserve the integrity and, and prevent any outside threats, the PUC finally requested the three powerful utilities uh, to deploy a smart uh, grid uh, deployment plan, which is not due until uh, this July of this year, which uh, I find humorous uh, given that uh, they're already deploying smart meters. You would think that they would have that plan in place before the deployment. Um, as of this point in time, there is no environmental review. Uh, I'm, I'm saying and I'm arguing that the deployment of creating 12 to 15 million uh, meters and installing them statewide is a new utility uh, communication and infrastructure, but there has been zero dollars in environmental review. And I'll finish with, uh, because I see my time is up, that I'll give you an anecdotal story. In my district alone, the repavement and reconstruction of 1.3 miles in my district, uh, partnering with PG&E with the undergrounding of utility dis uh, utilities, 
we had to spend $2 million for all environmental review. And uh, our utilities, the three big companies, are not required to spend one cent. And to me, that is unconscionable. This is a time for us to unite, to stand for choice, to stand against big government, and uh, it's time for us to stand for our civil liberties, to stand and protect our inalienable rights as uh, professed in our Constitution, and to preserve our democracy, one which is founded on free will and free choice. And uh, regarding this issue, if anybody should be wearing tinfoil hats, it should be the PUC. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Now, uh, Mark. I really appreciate being here, and I appreciate so many people coming out tonight because it's your involvement that's going to make a difference on smart meter policy as we move forward. You know, in 2005, TURN was the lone voice in the wilderness fighting, speaking out against smart meters. In 2005, nobody knew what smart meters were. The media was not interested. Our press releases went unread, no, nothing in the paper, and so most people didn't hear about smart meters until they came to their homes. Okay? And, you know, it, it wasn't until the fall of 2009 when uh, residents of Bakersfield uh, got up in arms and hundreds of them showed up at uh, town meetings and at hearings to complain about high bills and ina inaccurate billing that finally smart meters became a live public issue. Now, I will tell you that Turn as an organization remains unconvinced of the health dangers from smart meters, okay? We are an organization that just hasn't seen the level of evidence that convinces us. And we do think that there are other issues that I want to talk about in terms of smart meter policy that I think are important to pay attention to and what Turn is uh, uh, focusing on. We focus where we can make the most difference, and um, we're concerned about privacy protection for the energy use data that people have already talked about. We're concerned about limiting the use of remote shutoffs, okay? Um, when um, we, we fought for some uh, uh, protections and got the PUC to pass some, because when PG&E started putting in smart meters, they, they, they just went trigger happy when it came to shutoffs. And in one year, from August 2009, uh, disconnections went from 35,000 in pg and &E territory. A year later, in August 2010, 66% decrease to 12,000. And so that's the kind of stuff that we do to have an impact on policy. What we're really concerned about now is preventing the adoption of mandatory time-based pricing. Now, time-based pricing basically has two versions. One is we refer to as daytime pricing, and that's where they're going to charge a higher price during the daytime hours than during the nighttime hours. And this might be okay for people that go to work during the day, that aren't home, the kids are in school, but we're particularly concerned about people who are home because they're disabled, because they're retired, because they have small children. We don't think that they should pay a penalty for being at home during the day, okay? But, the, but there's something even worse. They call it critical peak pricing, which means nothing. I call it heat wave pricing. The 10 hottest days of the year they want to charge a tenfold increase for electricity on those days. That's why I call it heat wave pricing. This, we are, talk about a health threat. Let me talk about a, a, a health threat here. Um, the fact is, the fact is that um, heat waves in the United States result in more deaths than all natural disasters combined. Um, the victims of excessive heat are primarily elderly, poor, socially isolated. Um, in 2006, the severe heat wave here in California resulted from anywhere between 200 and 400 estimated deaths. Many of them were elderly, and a number of people 
voluntarily shut off their air conditioner because they were afraid they could not afford the bill. Heat wave pricing is going to make that much worse. So let me, let, let, let me talk about what we do think needs to happen. We do think that there are, you know, there are people who clearly have health conditions, um, who have been diagnosed with electromagnetic sensitivity. We do think that those folks should be accommodated by, by the utilities. Let me just end by giving you something that you can do to make a difference with energy policy. Right now, Southern California Edison has a rate increase request of $3 billion. And you have an opportunity to go to a CPUC hearing Wednesday, June 15, in Oxnard. Okay? It's the closest one to here, but that would be a place where you can talk about both your views about a $3 billion rate increase and your views about smart meters. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Tyson. Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Tyson Slocum, and I direct the energy program with Public Citizen in Washington, D.C. Uh, our website is www.citizen.org. Uh, I'm an environmentalist. I'm a consumer advocate. And when we first started looking at smart meters at the national level more than two years ago, I said, well, I'm concerned about the environment. I'm concerned that the United States uses double the electricity per person compared to many of our economic competitors. I'm concerned about climate change. And a lot of electric utilities and vendors and some environmentalists say that smart meters are a way to address that. I looked at the evidence and I teamed up with some of my other consumer allies like AARP and others. And when we looked at the evidence, it was clear that smart meters are being used in incredibly dumb ways, that they are remarkably expensive, they're not cost effective, and that the only thing smart about a smart meter is if you are an electric utility. <laughs> and I think that it's interesting that Southern California Edison couldn't bother to come to a citizen hearing like this, because if you're a large corporation, a large utility like Southern California Edison, why do you need to bother talking to the people that's what your lobbyists are for, and you don't talk to the people. You hire lobbyists and make the campaign contributions to control the legislatures, to talk to members of Congress, and to make sure that you've got a majority vote at the Public Utility Commission. Because the smart meter rollout, and Public Citizen co-authored a major white paper, mainly on the economics and the uh, uh, energy efficiency, uh, debunking the energy efficiency claims, and, and that white paper is available on our website at, at citizen.org. And when we looked at it, it was absolutely clear. Now, the state of California, through the Public Utility Commission, approved the requests by uh, the electric utilities in your state, uh, is charging Californians $5 billion to force the mandated installation of smart meters in every household. And public citizen's point of view is if folks would like to have a smart meter, and there are some people who would like to have them, there are some households and families that could benefit from them, and they should be able to have that option. Forcing that option on every household is a dumb policy. It is extraordinarily expensive, and the only benefit is to the utility. Now, there have been other state commissions that have looked at the same kind of evidence that public citizen looked at, that your state commission looked at and came to radically different conclusions. The state of Maryland, for example, last year had a smart meter proposal from Constellation Energy, which owns the largest utility, Baltimore Gas and Electric, in that state. And when they looked at it, and not only were the consumers of the state of Maryland going to be charged, but they also had free stimulus money that was coming in from the Stimulus Act uh, passed in, in February of uh, 2009 that was going to match dollar for dollar what consumers were going to pay in. And the state commission in Maryland, called the Public Service Commission, looked at that proposal and said, even though half the money is coming from the feds, this is not cost effective. We are overpaying because it does not make sense for every family to be forced to have these meters installed. If you're a large industrial facility or if your home 
has the kind of lighting that rivals Anaheim Stadium, then maybe having a smart meter installed in your home makes sense for you if you have all these fancy appliances that can talk. But asking regular folks, or even not regular folks, that don't have all of these fancy appliances that can communicate to their smart meter, this is an, a, a huge inefficient allocation of capital. All of the risk is on ratepayers, and we seek real reforms that will empower consumers to use energy more wisely, to be able to adjust when prices go up, but asking people to respond to dynamic pricing, what Mark was talking about, is absolutely an outrage. And my time is up, but we had a meeting with some White House staff at the Council on Environmental Quality last week, and they, we've got wind that they're coming out with a, a draft paper calling for the promotion of dynamic pricing across the United States. And I think that this would expose people to dangerous price spikes, just particularly for those folks that have to be at home, whether they're, they're, they're moms raising their kids or the elderly. Uh, uh, we want to provide rebates for folks to respond to price signals, not force them through punitive price signals, and definitely not through mandated usage of uh, smart meters. Thanks a lot for your time. I appreciate it. And last, we have Orlean. Thank you. Well, I also would like to thank Heather and all of the Santa Barbara Tea Party group for putting on this wonderful program. And it is great that this is coming to Southern California. As you know, we have been having this battle in Northern California for many months now. And I am very proud to say that I represent the conservative end of this. I am a Republican. I'm a member of the Sonoma County Republican Central Committee. And when I first found out about this, I presented a resolution to our committee asking for them to also come out strongly against the smart meter program. And they did. We had a unanimous decision. We were the first, Sonoma, Sonoma, the first county Republican Central Committee, probably in the nation, that has come out with a unanimous decision against the smart meter. I was. <laughs> I would also like to say that it's probably my fault that Southern California Edison decided to not come here. I was a guest on Andy's program on Tuesday afternoon, and I understand that it was after hearing me that they called up Heather and said they declined to come. So I apologize that I frightened them away. <laughs> but. But I do think they would have felt very uncomfortable here hearing this information. Just we invited PG&E often to come and be part of a panel, and they would not show up either. <clears throat> I represent Eagle Forum of California. I am the state president as well as the Sonoma County Eagle Forum president. Eagle Forum is a national organization that was started by Phyllis Schlafly back in the 1970s, and it is a very pro-life, pro-family pro-property rights and pro-privacy rights organization. And I really got started because I was concerned about the Big Brother aspect of this, and that is why I wrote my book, which is called Just Say No to Big Brother Smart Meter, the latest in biohazard technology. So I go into all of the other technology as well because PG&E told me there is no more concern about the radiation coming out of the smart meter than from your cell phone. So I thought, hmm, I guess I will investigate the cell phone. So I did. It's in my book as well as the cell phone towers. And all of these are having a cumulative effect on people's health. This pulsed radiation that is coming out of the cell phone towers is the same as the pulsed radiation that is coming into your home from the, the smart meter program. And you've heard how, how serious this is affecting people's health. Well, I also researched the federal bill that was supposedly mandating this, and I would like you to know that it is not mandating this. I asked Phyllis Schlafly's son, John Schlafly, who is an attorney, to please research this for me, and this is what he wrote back to me. He said, as I read the federal law, this is called Energy Policy Act of 2005, it does not mandate the utilities to install smart meters in homes. It only mandates the utilities to offer them and to install them upon customer request. And those are the words, upon customer request. 
So when they come and try to force this upon you, let them know this is not following the federal law. I also research California law, and I believe that this is a violation of several laws in our own state. And we, first of all, we, are, we have something similar to the First Amendment in our Constitution, that we are to have our laws protected, we are to enjoy and defend life and liberty, we are to enjoy possessing and protecting our own property, and we are to pursue and obtain safety, happiness, and privacy. And as you've heard from these excellent panelists, all of those things are being violated. I also researched, I have this natural Dutch curiosity I inherited from my Dutch relatives. I wanted to know where this is really coming from. So the last chapter of my book, I let, I let you know that smart meter is part of smart grid, smart grid is part of smart growth, smart growth is part of United Nations Agenda 21. And for those of you who wonder why is this not just happening in the United States, it is happening all over the world. It is much farther along in Europe than it is here because it is being pushed by the UN and this is all part of the Agenda 21 program. And if any of you do not know what that is, we're putting on our state conference for Eagle Forum with the whole theme of exposing the many tentacles of Agenda 21. One of our speakers is Patrick Wood, who is coming from the state of Washington. He discovered that there was a book called Technocracy that was written back in 1932 that had this all planned out. They knew that back in 1932, the technology was not advanced enough but by our day it would be where they could have 24-hour surveillance of our homes. And that is really what the smart meter is doing for us. So I urge you to also take a stand, as many of you already have, as we have in Northern California, and maybe you can bring this to a screeching halt also in Southern California. Thank you for being here.